All right, hey everybody. Yeah, uh, that last panel, that was a great segue into this topic. Um, echoing John's comments, uh, privacy is a prerequisite for security, for personal security. And I think a good strategy to personal security is plausible deniability, which is what we're gonna talk about for the next 20 minutes or so. Um, you guys met Roger earlier, um, co-founder and president of the Tor Project, is that accurate? Um, and I'm excited to introduce Ahmed Kapoor as well. He is the general counsel of the NIM project. Uh, they're doing really important work in privacy. Do you guys wanna, you wanna quickly introduce NIM and then Roger, introduce yourself again? Yeah, so uh, my name is Ahmed Kapoor. I'm general counsel for uh, NIM Technologies and I'm a professor of law at Boston University School of Law. Um, NIM provides a, a mix net that provides network level anonymity. Um, as well as uh, something called ZK NIMS, which are a credentialing technology that uh, essentially are anonymous credentials or ZK credentials. Hi, hi, I'm Roger. Uh, you met me earlier at the keynote. I work on Tor, which is a privacy, security, anonymity, censorship resistant system. And uh, part of the fun of Tor is the variety of users around the world who rely on it. We are a nonprofit. We are part of a broader community of people trying to make the world a safer place. Thank you for the work that both of you are doing for the privacy community. Uh, we have limited time, so let's let's dive right in. Um, let's start by defining this thing we keep talking about. What does plausible deny What does plausible deniability mean to you, uh, Roger? Do you want to kick off? Yeah, so we inherited this phrase from the per people who put together the panels. Uh, I might go with the phrase uh, significant non-infringing use or something from a, a legal perspective, but I, I mean, there are a lot of different pieces to it. I think the, the most interesting part of the panel should be how do you frame your project in a way that you don't attract the wrong attention and in a way that it's sustainable and that you can actually succeed at reaching your users and giving millions of people safety without getting shut down or attacked by the wrong people. So I, maybe because I'm an academic as well as a lawyer, I've been thinking about the definition for a couple of days actually and asking folks that I run into. Um, and so, so far there are two uh, sort of major definitions for plausible deniability. There's the definition that, you know, I came into the conference thinking about, which is, you know, uh, some organizational actor wants to shield their uh, accountability uh, within the organization and therefore, uh, it, you know, certain activities are structured so that the head of an organization uh, has no knowledge about what is actually happening and therefore has plausible deniability, right? Um, and then there's the other definition, uh, which I've sort of uh, come to, to know over the past couple of days, which is, uh, well, plausible deniability is more, um, it's more about uh, whether or not someone can prove you did something under a particular threat model. Um, so whether or not the evidence that's available under a particular uh, threat model uh, can point to a person or uh, a group of people having done or attribute them or attribute some group of act activities to that person or group of people. Um, so if we're going to stick with the latter, which is, I see Lane nodding his head, right? So if we're going to stick with the latter, I would propose that, you know, um, at least we, we try in the next 10 minutes to come up with a substitute phrase because uh, one of my issues with the phrase plausible deniability is uh, it makes people think you're up to no good, right? So really what we're doing is uh, shielding uh, our private information, right? And just because you want to shield private information, just because your particular threat model is broad for whatever reason, maybe the freedom to think and explore and have your thoughts, for example, um, then maybe we need a different term. And let me jump on that word prove that you said. Like, imagine you've got five bloggers in Iran and you don't know which of the five of them posted the thing and you can't prove which five, so it's fine, right? Well, no. That's bad news for all five of them. So we want something, we want systems that make it, that protect people at a stage earlier than that. So it's not about, you think it was me, but you can't prove it, ha ha. It's about, you don't even know where to start looking. Yeah, thank you guys. That's uh, really helpful framing for our short but exciting conversation. I, I realized I skipped my introduction earlier and normally, I don't care that much about introducing myself because I want you to hear from these guys, but I think it is relevant to the topic. Um, 
I am a blockchain core developer. Um, I worked on the Ethereum protocol for a while, uh, and then more recently, I'm working on a new protocol, a new project called Space Mesh. Um, but I mention Ethereum specifically because in the time that I was working as an Ethereum core developer, um, there were cases of other core developers on the project who quit because of concerns about legal liability, right? Because as, as we spoke about earlier, like we software developers are often very naive about kind of the legal side of things. We're kind of vaguely aware that by doing the work that we're doing, of course, it varies very much from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. As an American based in the United States, I do feel some degree of protection under uh, free speech laws, something else we could talk about, but not all of my colleagues were or are Americans, don't necessarily have those protections. Roger, as you pointed out, even as an American, if I'm, you know, another country might choose to, um, you know, chase after me for because they have different laws where they are. Um, there's a lot of naivete and there's a lot of um, fear on the part of core developers of protocols, things that touch upon privacy and security. Um, what do we What do we do about this situation? And so, last point: the chilling effect that the Tornado Cash sanctions uh, and and their jailing of one of the core developers of that protocol had last year. Uh, I, we all believe in building software to solve these problems, to, to, to increase privacy, to make the world a better place. Um, what message do you guys have for the people building these, these sorts of things? Yeah, so we take two approaches in the Tor world. One of them is we have allies in the legal policy world like EFF and ACLU and Bits of Freedom and so on. And we need to strengthen them at making sure that, that we have the rights and that it's clear uh, that we should be able to write software to, 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 to make people safer. So that's the first step. The second step is proactively go out to these law enforcement or governments or whatever organizations and teach them how these tools work, teach them what Tor is, why it's important that it needs to continue existing, why it has a lot of different users and those use cases are important. So going to what you might refer to as the adversary, and this is tricky. Like I, I talked in the, in the keynote about the Department of Justice case. I didn't mention there were like five Department of Justice lawyers, but there were 15 Secret Service people who walked in and sat around the back of the room. They never took their sunglasses off. They never said a word. And that's just, I mean, maybe that's just normal, like... That's terrifying. <laughs> that, yeah, maybe that's normal resting Secret Service face or something, but that's not... It, 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 it takes practice and skill and courage to go do that, but you have to. You have to get them to understand you as human beings and to realize that you're doing this for good reasons. So just to tack on to that, since the question was, you know, what do we suggest that the developers do? Um, I, um, I completely agree with Roger's points, but I don't expect your average developer to both, maybe you should donate to the ACLU and EFF, but I don't really expect you to engage with government regulators on, on the regular, right? Uh, and especially not the DOJ. Um, please see me if you have any thoughts on doing that. It, uh, that was a joke. Okay. So, um, but I think one thing that you can do is educate yourself, right? Just as Roger saying we need to educate the regulators and the governments generally on what exactly is going on, what are the trade-offs in a lot of their policies of enforcement and their substantive regulatory policies, we have to educate ourselves to really understand what the difference is between you know, content of code and the conduct that you perform out in the world. Conduct more looks at you know, who you're talking to, who you might be conspiring with, uh, who you are selling your code to and how, what are your communications, what are the representations you're making out into the world. Whereas content is more, at least in my mind, sort of the more sort of pure just sitting in, sitting in front of a screen and coding. I think that so long as you're sitting in front of a screen and coding, more or less, you're going to be okay. Uh, more or less, I say, right? Um, and, but I think it's really up to coders uh, to educate themselves on the regulations and the laws. And frankly, um, you know, I, at Boston University, I've taught a class on privacy, security, and technology to a combined class of computer science majors and law students. And I found the computer science majors to be just as capable of understanding everything that I was talking about. So don't sell yourself selves short, right? And just educate up. So one strategy that seems to make sense is engaging with the quote unquote adversary, as you mentioned. I think that makes a lot of sense. I think we should all be doing that. We should be having those conversations, making them understand 
our motivations for building the things we're building and you know, making it clear that we're doing this to make the world a better place. Another strategy which you highlighted is educating yourself, which I think is important. Um, there will still be those among us who choose the path of kind of like pseudonymity or anonymity as software developers. We have quite a few pseudonymous folks in our community. I'm just wondering if you guys have any thoughts on this. Is pseudonymity, anonymity a good idea? Is it, um, I don't know, what, what advice would you have for people who are considering going that direction? Well, um, in term, is it a good idea? I think it's something that you have a right to do, and therefore I support it, right? Uh, and I think that's different um, than answering the normative question of, like, is what I'm doing a good idea? Um, is, uh, and that really turns on what your goal is, right? Um, what is the strategic goal? So if a bunch of, uh, if every developer working on a privacy project went underground, um, my guess is that that would draw a lot of attention, and my guess is that attention would not only harm the uh, group of developers uh, or that went underground, but also harm the rest of us, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm a little on the fence in terms of, you know, recommending that folks go underground, per se. I know Roger has a pretty strong opinion on this, and I kind of agree with it. Um, and so I'm just going to, that's my way of saying, Roger, what's your opinion on this? Yeah, so if you can, I'm a big fan of transparency. If you're in a situation where you can identify yourself and proudly say, this is what I'm doing and this is why it is okay for people to be doing this, you should. It will help you a lot in the long term in terms of community building and trust building. We've seen there are some anonymity systems out there that where all the uh, developers are, are pseudonymous or anonymous, and you don't hear that much about them. They don't get the uh, level of peer review and scrutiny. They don't have the community around them that systems like Tor has. So, I mean, it depends what your situation is. If you're in a country where you really shouldn't be involved in any of this stuff, then you don't have that, that choice. But when it, I mean, even if you are, like, I remember talking to bloggers in uh, Turkey and Egypt and Iran years ago, and they're like, yes, of course I put my name on my blog, because if I didn't put my name on my blog, nobody would read it. Like, everybody knows there are uh, people who lie on their blog, so I, I need to put my name, even though there's risk involved in doing it. So there's, there's a lot to be said for, uh, for proudly standing up and saying, yes, it's me. And uh, again, at, at first it looks like a contradiction. You're working in the privacy space and choosing to identify yourself, but you're doing that in order to make your impact stronger and more sustainable. So maybe, maybe one of the lessons here is if you're going to go anonymous or not, then you have to go full anon or full transparency, right? An abundance of transparency or an abundance of just disappearing out of the face of the earth, I think. Yeah, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, I, I think there are, while I generally agree with what Roger was saying, I think if you do have the choice, you absolutely should identify yourself because it goes a long way towards building trust. You know, you're putting your own identity on the line. There's accountability there. That, and there's less of that if you're anonymous or pseudonymous. Um, you know, when I kind of began working in this space and kind of broadly cryptocurrency, cryptography, security, blockchain, et cetera, a few years ago, I had, we had like pseudonymous people join my team. And it was really weird in the beginning. You know, they'd be like, yeah, we can join the calls, but we're not going to speak. We're just going to like use text message and we didn't know their real name. Um, I just got used to it. And like now it's like fairly common in the circles that I move in as a software developer. And I think it's like kind of cool. I, I kind of regret not being pseudonymous myself, but that ship has sailed. <laughs> There's actually a, a good hybrid combination there where like many of the tour people are identified, but as you say, there are pseudonyms and the fact that hi, I'm Roger, I'm in front of you, I have met this person, I don't care what their passport says, but exactly. I've met them, so I'll vouch for them. And that means that you haven't met them, but it's fine because you've met me, so this peer-to-peer -peer social network works. So there, the, like, there's an operating system called Tails that's Debian-based that builds in Tor and a bunch of other things, and all of the developers of Tails are pseudonyms. I've met many of them, they're great people. I don't know what their real name is, I don't care what their real name is, but I've met them and spent a lot of time with, con at, with them at conferences, so that, that hybrid approach it, can be very powerful. Yeah, you can definitely build a reputation around a pseudonym. 
Um, all right, well, we're, we're almost out of time already. This, the time has gone very quickly. So I think my final question is, we've touched upon this notion of a threat model a few times. You know, anyone who's serious about security, any, any cryptographer will tell you, you're, you, know, you need to start by identifying your threat model. Um, what is your threat model with respect to plausible deniability or that of your organization? And what threat model should we, software developers, builders, building privacy, security, technology, um, be contemplating? What, what, in other words, what do we what do we want to plausibly deny, and from whom? <laughs> well, uh, that's a really good question. Just uh, so a couple of thoughts on this. So first of all, uh, Roger's point about the five bloggers in Iran, right? So maybe in that threat model, you have a situation where plausible deniability is not sufficient, and you need full-on anonymity, right? So that's that's a perfect example of that. Um, in terms of my own threat model or our company's threat model and M technologies. Um, personally, I believe in uh, almost radical transparency when it comes to these things. I think transparency is a lot better uh, if you are compliant, frankly. And you know, demonstrating that over and over is a very good thing to do if you happen to have the characteristics of compliance with the regime or entity or structures that you're working within. Right? And this is not really a case for anyone who's blogging in Iran or anti-regime, et cetera. Um, but you know, for myself, I think we are in a comfortable position to be radically transparent. Yeah, so I agree with all of that. I've talked about transparency a lot. So I'm going to pivot to uh, East Turkestan, the Uyghur province in China. You might know of it as Xinjiang. Uh, I talked to somebody from there who's like, uh, yeah, your software is not relevant to me because I can't go a block without providing my passport and I'm not allowed to go past a block because I have the wrong kind of passport. They stole my children and they're sending them to school to teach them how to be proper Chinese people and I see them once a week but all they do is yell at, all my child does is yell at me for not being a proper Chinese person. Uh, I can't have a laptop of my own. So thinking through what your tools can help with and remembering that there are situations where your tools are not going to be enough because uh, because the, the world is a shitty place in some situations uh, is an important motivator. Awesome. Yeah, I think that's a great note to end on. Just it's, it's really important to be reminded that not everyone is as fortunate as we are um, and that the tools we're building, you know, they're for, they're, there's, they can move the needle for people in parts of the world that are, you know, subject to less than ideal kind of jurisdictions and laws and things like this. And like, we're not just building these things for ourselves, right? We're building these things for, for people all over the place. Um, I don't know, that's my motivation. That's why I do what I do. So thank you for highlighting that example. I think we're out of time. That was fast. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you.